I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. Now, for today... Okay, okay, all right. Everyone, everyone just calm down. Calm, remember your training? We, we, we trained for this. We prepared for this. Duck! Are we dead? Are we dead? Are we? We okay? We're okay? Everybody alive? Okay. Whew. Okay, that was close, man. I just, I'm glad we're okay because there's way too much stuff that I still have to accomplish before shuffling off this mortal coil, man. Like, like eating everything on the Taco Bell menu, man. I know that sounds gross, but whatever, man. These are desperate times. Don't shit on my dreams. Uh, so in case you guys don't know or are just completely unaware because you've been hiding out in your doomsday bunker, it was recently revealed that North Korea figured out how to make nuclear warheads small enough to place them on their already existing missiles. And North Korea's leader, uh, head minion Kim Jong-un, has threatened to use these nuclear warheads against the United States. Now, normally when a threat of that magnitude is lobbed in our direction, uh, the president will usually sit down, usually come up with a measured response. We're looking at all of our options. We're trying to figure out what the best way to go about doing this is. Uh, we should take this carefully one step at a time. But we have <laughs> Donald Trump, who is not one to back down from any sort of fight. So he decided instead to lob a threat back at North Korea and said that they will, what, 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 did, you, what did you say again, Donald? They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. And so following the North Korean threat and the American rebuttal, many Americans responded to this exchange by immediately Googling how deep underground you have to go to survive a nuclear attack. But amidst all this talk of North Korea and the US going nuke for nuke, it got me thinking about the first time that America did do battle with North Korea. Because yes, we have fought these guys before. Unfortunately, a lot of Americans don't even know about the Korean War. And those that do, don't really know very much about it, which is why that the Korean War is also also known as the Forgotten War because it only happened a few years after World War II and was overshadowed by that story. So why did we fight in Korea? Why did the United States get involved in a conflict that lasted only for three years but led to an estimated five million people losing their lives? One word. Communism. So following the defeat of Japan in 1945, which officially marked the end of World War II, the Soviet Union and the United States now had control of Korea, which was formerly a part of the Japanese Empire. And the Soviets in the United States were trying to figure out exactly what to do with Korea. How are we going to divide it? Because the Soviets obviously have one side of the country, the United States has another side of the country. In 1947, the UN declared that Korea should be one unified country, but the Soviets did not like that plan. So the country essentially was divided in half at a line known as the 38th parallel, with the Soviets occupying the North under the leadership of communist dictator Kim Il-sung, and the South being backed by the United States under the leadership of anti-communist ruler Syngman Rhee. Now, before we get into the actual war itself, let me provide you guys with just a little bit of context, because as we've learned, context is key, perspective is key everything. Near the end of World War II, after FDR passed away, Harry Truman became president of the United States and flew overseas to meet with Joseph Stalin, the head of the Soviet Union. And Stalin's relationship with FDR was a relatively civil one. But with Truman, the two of them just didn't really get along with each other all that well. Furthermore, following World War II, the United States started to get a bit wary of the Soviets due to the fact that they were slowly spreading uh, their communist regime throughout Eastern Europe. And on top of that, in 1949, the Soviets successfully test their very own atomic weapons, so we're not the only ones on the board with the big bombs. Additionally, in 1947, diplomat George Kennan wrote what became known as the Long Telegram, which advocated for the containment of communism, okay? Kennan wrote, quote, the main element of any United States policy toward the Soviet Union must be that of a long-term, patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies, end quote. Now, Kennan's piece definitely interested President Truman, okay? Definitely caught his eye. And then later in 1947, President Truman would introduce what would later become known as the Truman Doctrine, which basically states that any foreign country that wanted to fight against the spread of communism would receive aid and funding from the United States. Plus, in April of 1950, a memo is released by the National Security Council that's called NSC 68. The memo pushed for a, quote, rapid buildup of political 
political, economic, and military strength, end quote. So the United States could, quote, roll back the Kremlin's drive for world domination. In summation, following World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union would go on to butt heads for a really long time in what becomes known as the Cold War. And one of the first real tests of this rivalry happens in 1950 in Korea. So here's how it goes down, guys. In the spring of 1950, Kim Il-sung, again, the leader of the northern side of Korea, which is backed by the Soviet Union, he decides that he wants to forcefully take South Korea, or in his case, he wants to liberate South Korea. Now, Stalin endorses Kim Il-sung's plan to take over South Korea, but it's not like a full endorsement. Like, yeah, that's a great idea. It's more like a, I mean, I guess... You could do that. I mean, all right, sure, whatever you want. He's kind of hesitant to fully endorse the plan. And the reason he doesn't fully endorse the idea is because he knows that if the North tries to forcefully take over the South, which is being controlled by the United States, there's going to be all-out war against the U.S. And he does not want that to happen. So he doesn't fully endorse the plan. But he also realizes that, okay, if the war turns against North Korea, then I can use that as a way to encourage China to get involved in the war. Because remember, China is also a communist country. Meanwhile, the North Korean military gears up and it crosses the 38th parallel, the line dividing the north and the south, and they launch a surprise attack on Seoul, the capital city of South Korea, and they take the city. They take the city on June 28, 1950. Now, President Truman sees this act going on, and he sees it as communist aggression, and he decides that the United States has to intervene and help out, because if they don't, then, quote, the Soviets will keep right on going and swallow up one place after another. End quote. So the United Nations puts together a fighting force, which will be led by General Douglas MacArthur, and they head into Korea to help bolster the South Korean military, which at this time is very ill-prepared. It's frightened. It's scared. It's confused. They, they are not what the North Koreans are like, which are well-disciplined, uh, well-armed, well-trained. Now, MacArthur sees what's going on in Seoul, and he decides, we're not going to go the defensive strategy. We're not just going to play defense and try to keep these guys out of the city. No, no, no. We're going to beat these back over the 38th parallel and I'm going to blow them into oblivion. We are going on the offensive. So MacArthur first launches an assault at Incheon, which is a city that borders Seoul and the assault is successful. The UN forces beat back the North Koreans out of Seoul and they reclaim the city. But MacArthur, now, now he sees blood in the water, man, and he plans to keep on going. So the Allied troops go ahead and push the North Korean military all the way back past the 38th parallel and they push them near the Yalu River, which is a border that North Korea shares with China. Now, you guys remember when I told you that if the war turned against North Korea, Stalin would use that as a way to encourage the Chinese to get involved in the war? This was their cue. Chinese leader Mao Zedong sends 300,000 Chinese soldiers to stop a potential allied offensive from coming into China, and it works. The Chinese forces, being incredibly large, 300,000 strong, roll up the allied offensive, and they send the allies retreating back south over the 38th parallel. And this retreat pisses off General Douglas MacArthur, okay? There is no room for retreat in his army, in his war. He wants to go all in on this war, and he wants to rid this region of communists, the communist regime, anything having to do with the word communist, he wants out. So what he wants to do is take this war to the next step. He wants to bring in atomic bombs. So he goes to the government, and he says, hey, bring me the big guns, man. If we drop these big bombs on Korea, on China, we are going to rid them all of communists. They will never be a problem again. We can go home happy but the government and president truman are like no no we don't we don't want to use those bombs again because if we do i'm pretty sure we're going to bring about world war three don't want to do that we just finished world war ii there's no need to complete the trilogy anytime soon so macarthur who believes that the only kind of victory is absolute victory denounces truman publicly basically is like the president is a He's not going to give me these bombs he's a scared little boy he doesn't want to do this so truman fires back oh 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 i'm a i'm a I'm, I'm a scared little boy. Is that what you're saying? Okay, okay. I may be a in your eyes, but you know what? I'm still the president. You are fired, mother. You do not get to run this war anymore. Go home. Goodbye. Peace. So Truman fires MacArthur in April of 1951, and then starting in June of 1951, the Korean War falls into a stalemate. Brutal fighting is happening near the 38th parallel, but no side is really gaining very much ground. One side may advance, and then they'll retreat, and then the other side advances and then retreats, but nothing doesn't really move from that area for the most part. At the same time, both sides are trying to negotiate peace talks and are trying to figure out a peace agreement because they don't want this war lasting any longer than 
necessary. But unfortunately, these talks will go on for another two years. No result will occur until 1953. Finally, on July 27, 1953, the UN Allied Forces and North Korea come together and they declare peace. Actually, no, that's not, that's not what happened at all. Instead, they sign an armistice, which for those of you that don't know what an armistice is, it's an agreement that basically says, okay, the fighting that's going on right now, that's going to stop. But technically, technically, it doesn't mark the end of the war. It basically means, okay, we're just going to put the war on hold. We're going to put the war over here right now, and we're going to focus on peace treaties, peace negotiations. We're going to get those done, and then we'll be officially over and done with this thing. Except for the fact that the, the Korean War... There never was a peace treaty signed. There never were peace negotiations that were finalized. So technically, basically, more or less, in a manner of speaking, the Korean War is still happening. It's still like it's still on hold. Like at any point, it could restart again if they really wanted it to. It's not going to yet. It hasn't for but 60 some years. But technically, it's still there. It's still happening. The agreement also declares that the 38th parallel will now be that demilitarized zone, the DMZ. That is the border between North and South Korea. That is what's going to remain. And to this day, if you go to South Korea, you can go and take a tour of the 38th parallel. You can go to the DMZ and you can go see it for yourself. They, they offer tours there. And if you do go to the DMZ, if you go take a tour of it, when you get there, you will see North and South Korean soldiers standing on either side of the, of the 38th parallel and just staring at each other all day, just looking at each other through binoculars, using their eyes to look at you, just staring at you, just waiting, waiting for the other to make a move. Oh, I, I wish, I wish you would make a move, son. I would say that the tension is so thick at the 38th parallel that you could probably cut it with a knife, but then at the same time, I feel like if you brandish a knife at the 38th parallel, you will probably kick off the fighting from where it left off. So the moral of this whole episode, do not take a knife with you to the 38th parallel probably not a good idea. So there you have it, my friends, the story of the Korean War that technically, basically, sorta, kinda, isn't really over yet. And if things continue to escalate the way they have been between the United States and North Korea, it's not gonna be good. Not just for the two countries, but for anybody that lives on the planet. So thank you guys so much for hanging with me this episode, man. Really do appreciate it. I know it was a little bit longer, but I definitely wanted to make sure I covered as much of the Korean War as I could so that you had a better understanding of it. But uh, also thank you for subscribing to the channel, for those of you that have, uh, for sharing the videos, for liking the videos, for leaving comments on them, man. Let me know your thoughts on the Korean War in the comment section down below, man. I'd love to discuss and debate with you guys. As always, you can follow US 101 on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. All the links to those social media accounts are down below in the description box and guys i uh i really want to get into next week's episode because next week's episode is going to be just based on what happened in in charlottesville in virginia this this past weekend i oh, i'm gonna get into that next week all right we're, we're gonna talk about some stuff but until then i am all done and uh remember if there is nuclear fallout make sure to uh wipe down your entire body with a towel remove all your clothes irradiated clothes put them in a bag seal them away take a shower wash your entire body uh, unless of course you are in the blast radius in which case none of this applies because you will already be dead sweet dreams <laughs>